The Buffalo Bills took the field almost a week after DeMar Hamlin's injury. And while DeMar Hamlin is still in hospital care, he's been transferred from Cincinnati back to Buffalo. The breathing tubes is out and he's in high spirits, talking to friends and family. Because of the amount of prayer support and media attention from fans and colleagues, the NFL has chosen to treat this injury different than how it normally operates. Please like and subscribe and we'll get right to today's video. The average NFL career lasts four years, and it takes three years to get vested in the NFL. DeMar Hamlin has only been in the NFL for two years, so it was a lot of questions out there that needed to be answered. He feels about it. Let's be, keep it real. Why we don't talk about the stuff that matters? This young man, you want to know, you want to know how, how, what this, you need to know about him? He's 24 years old, right? He got a contract for $160,000. That's his bonus. And he earns $825,000 this year. You say, G. Bush, why are you talking about this man's money? Because guess what? He's been in the league two years. That means he's not vested. That means if he never plays another down in his life, he don't get another check for the NFL. Let's be clear about this. You got to play three to four years before you even sniff a pension. So all this heartwarming and prayers and condolences don't do nothing for that boy's mom. That, that got to go home, look at her son, and he might need extensive care for the rest of his life. And you know what the NFL will tell you? Well, you know, um, you know, we, we'll, we'll look out for the people like him. No, you won't. No, you won't. Let, let's talk about the disability policy for the NFL, right? They moved it from $22,000 a month to $4,000 in the last collective bargaining agreement. Did you know? The DNFL has a private board that reviews all aspects with their doctors and with and with their neurologists and their specialists. They can deny benefits even if Social Security deems you to be permanently disabled. The league can come back and then say, you know, the national go the government is a you know they're they're experts, but let's take it over so we don't pay anything out. Only fifteen percent get approved by Social Security. The league says that number should be lower. This article from the Washington Post breaks it down even further. One in four retirees will need a joint replacement. They suffer arthritis at five times the rate of their peers and are four times as likely to suffer neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's or ALS. The NFL health insurance lasts five years after retirement. Players who last fewer than three seasons don't qualify for it at all. But the most serious health consequences of a football career often don't manifest for a decade or more after they finish playing. The NFL Disability Board has a denial rate of almost 60%. While the players in the NFL is over 70% black, the NFL itself has a history of racist anti-black procedures. From 1934 to 1946, the NFL had a ban on black players. In the 60s and 70s, as America started to integrate, so did the NFL. And this is when you started to see droves of black players coming to the NFL, but only at certain positions. The NFL practiced racial stacking. And this is a term used by sociologists to describe a sorting process in which individuals are funneled into certain positions based on stereotypes. The down-the-middle positions of center, inside linebacker, and quarterback were considered to be thinking spots. As such, they were seen as too cerebral for African-American athletes who additionally were thought to lack the leadership and grit to lead other players and perform under duress. Now, I know what some of you guys are thinking. It was the 60s and the 70s. America was a different place. This was a vestige of Jim Crow America. But I don't want you guys to forget how the NFL tried to use uh, some of these racial tropes to marginalize black players' cognitive skills because it'll come back up. In 1989, the Los Angeles Raiders hired Art Shell. He became the first black head coach in the modern era of the NFL. Many thought Shell's hiring would open the floodgates for other black head coaches, but in the 33 years since Shell's hiring, there's been 191 head coaching vacancies in the NFL. Only 24 have went to black coaches. Currently in the NFL, there's only two head coaches that are black. There was three, but today, Houston, Texas head coach Lovey Smith was terminated after his first year. 
In 2002, the famed attorney Johnny Cochran released a report titled Black Coaches in the National Football League, Superior Performance, Inferior Opportunity. It showed that over 15 years, black NFL coaches averaged more wins than their white counterparts and yet had harder times getting hired and were more likely to get fired. Cochran then threatened to sue the NFL if it did not change its hiring practices. Even with the inception of the Rooney Rule in 2003, which stated if a coaching job came up in the NFL that a minority had to be interviewed for that job, the boost in black coaches from 2003 to 2010 was just temporary, only lasting less than a decade. And if that's not enough, nothing screams racism louder than how the NFL dealt to handle its CTE problem. Since the CTE settlement, only six and a half percent of the settlement has been paid according to the admin's website. I looked it up yesterday. And 60% of the claims have a qualifying diagnosis but have not been paid. In 2013, the NFL agreed to pay out $765 million to former players who suffered from CTE ailments. Part of this settlement was that the NFL never had to admit that football caused CTE. Over 60% of those tested for CTE were denied payouts, even when they showed signs of early dementia. That's because the NFL has insisted on using a scoring algorithm on the dementia testing that assumes black men start with lower cognitive skills. The NFL urges doctors to use race norming. Race norming is a practice of adjusting test scores to account for race or ethnicity of the test taker. This racist practice was continued by the NFL, ignoring former players' death, denying money that would save lives. It took not only multiple lawsuits, but the George Floyd riots for the NFL to stop this racist practice in 2021. It is my belief, when you look at how the NFL has galvanized its messaging and media around the health of DeMar Hamlin, that this league is trying to rebrand themselves using one American Freedman tragedy as a race-positive cloak to cover up his racist, anti-black, exploitative treatment of black male bodies. This league built a billion-dollar industry for running black men into each other until their bodies and brains no longer work. While the league is obligated to put these black men back together, whom they physically and financially broken through work-related injuries, in so many cases, they've decided to discard these same once heralded men back into America's bottom cast from which they came. We can't let the NFL blindside us. With the feel-good story of the NFL doing right by DeMar Hamlin, when time and time again they've applied racist workplace practices to deny former players humane rights, while I hope DeMar Hamlin makes a full recovery, and gets to live his normal life, just know if the NFL wants to rebrand itself from its history of black male body exploitation, it's going to have to do more than rectifying one man's issue. Let me know what you guys think about this video in the comment section. Did you know the NFL was using race norming practices to deny black NFL players from getting a CTE award? Thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe. Peace.